thank you for the invitation while I'm trying to get that up. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Riza and um, really appreciate being able to meet the group and discuss the work from the Allen Institute. Um, yes, I hope if I've understood the ask uh, for this format that uh, this will be appropriate. Um, what I'd like to do is to give an overview, uh, an introduction to my work and, and sort of the overall scope of work on the human uh, surgical tissue uh, at the Allen Institute. And to um, then sort of dive into just, you know, breadth, but not depth on um, uh, basically vignettes on how we're using the tissue, what sort of approaches um, kind of spanning from the tried and true uh, all the way to things that are very uh, risky and uh, it's not clear how successful they could be. Uh, we're actively trying to de-risk and uh, everything in between. And I hope that this will be good for initiating uh, discussions and, and further conversation. And I would just say, you know, I hope that people will focus on uh, the high level points and not get too bogged down in the details of the slides, but it's great that it's being recorded so that if people are highly interested when you go back and you you watch, you can, uh, you know, take your time to digest some of the content of the slides if it's too much at this time. Um, so just as a way of uh, introduction of myself, uh, I'm an assistant investigator at the Allen Institute for Brain Science, where I've worked for seven years. And um, I came there for the unique opportunity to um, help launch a new program uh, accessing human neurosurgical tissue for uh, functional studies, uh, starting with patch clamp recording and uh, sort of the, the tried and true approach of uh, morphoelectric characterization. And over the years, my interests have evolved uh, with the program uh, to really be more Jonathan. looking across. Jonathan, across. Yes. If I can just stop you, you you're still in the we, we, we see on our screen is your PowerPoint uh, uh, mode, not the presentation uh, mode yet. Hmm. PowerPoint show, let's try that one. Is that better? Yes, perfect. Excellent, thank you for telling me. Um, yeah, my, my interests have evolved with the program and now we're doing a lot of work sort of across species and trying to really understand what are the conserved and what are the divergent features of human neurons. And so for that, we've been working with the local National Primate Research Center at University of Washington, which is uh, fortunately just a mile away. And it's been really wonderful having this opportunity. Um, and uh, largely the work these days focuses on multimodal uh, characterization in brain slices uh, adapting this patch seek uh, approach where we're able to record electrophysiology, fill the cells to recover morphology, and then also pull out the nuclei at the end and do single cell profiling to get the whole transcriptome of each individual cell. Uh, and so this is what we refer to as sort of triple modality data and really um, amazing that this technique works. And so we really uh, apply this in, in everything that we do now. Uh, but to give you sort of the broadest overview of the Allen Institute um, cell types program, which is the largest program uh, in brain science, um, that we really have these parallel pipelines working on both the mouse brain and the human brain uh, to the extent possible in parallel. And this has been going on for about five years now. Um, and we create these data pipelines with standardized approaches uh, with the intent of um, producing a, a product that is uh, distributed to the community uh, and open access. And um, the three main axes are electrophysiology, morphology, and transcriptomes or epigenomes. Um, and uh, the goal is to do multimodal characterization um, to the extent possible. And even as I mentioned with the patch seek that we can uh, measure all of these uh, from single cells. Uh, but there are many uh, variations on that theme uh, from uh, morphoelectric characterization to pure transcriptomic characterization of gene expression profiles of individual cells. Uh, and uh, I'll give you some flavors of that. But the point here is that the point is uh, to make all of the data available, freely available to anybody uh, with an internet connection um, and uh, hopefully that these are impactful and uh, widely used uh, data sets uh, through this portal um, 
brainmap.org or uh, celltypes.brain-map.org. And um, in the beginning, uh, as it was touched on in the introduction, that really a critical point that uh, won't be overemphasized, but you know, there is no program without this access to the surgical tissues or postmortem tissues. And so we spent a long time building a network uh, in the local Seattle area. Uh, you can see the faces of many of our neurosurgeon uh, and neuropathologist collaborators. We have um, half a dozen or so actively contributing in this program. Uh, and uh, I would say the breakdown is that we have roughly 50, 40 to 50 surgical specimens per year. So quite good access about once per week, but it, it goes in waves. And 70% of those cases on average are epilepsy derived and about 30% are uh, from brain cancer cases. Uh, and of course, epilepsy cases are mostly uh, enriched in the temporal lobe, whereas the cancer uh, cases could be anywhere in the cortex, uh, but uh, largely uh, occur in the frontal areas. And uh, um, worth mentioning, as you said, that the group here is very interested in um, in, in pain circuits and, and maybe a lot of interest in cord, uh, that we're very focused and, and interested in the cortex, but uh, we're transitioning now to interest in uh, subcortical areas as well. Although the access to surgical tissues is, is uh, you know, much greater uh, in the cortical areas, which is, that's part of the, the, the calculus. Um, and so in the beginning, we started with this morphoelectric classification of the human uh, neocortical neurons, trying to build um, taxonomy of cell types, or, or uh, I think of a catalog uh, based on these uh, morphologies and uh, physiological features uh, measured from single cells using patch clamp recording and brain slices. Um, we have a cell types database. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the addresses below where we have over 400 uh, human single neurons that were recorded with uh, standardized physiology and uh, over 150 um, morphological reconstructions of a uh, vari wide variety of neurons across all of the cortical layers. And uh, you can see the diversity of types here. It's really uh, uh, remarkable, but uh, reasonably well known based on work of Cajal and, and previous uh, work. Uh, and, and one of the questions is really, uh, are there cell types out there that we haven't identified yet that are, are waiting to be discovered, which would be very exciting. Um, but beyond the morphology, it's to really get to the linkage of different data modalities and what is the correspondence here between the morphological uh, description of types and the electrophysiological types. Uh, in our one of our early studies, uh, we um, published comparative uh, data of the mouse and human single neuron properties, and we're, we're surprised to see some really dramatic divergence. Um, so just to really summarize and, and point you to some of the key findings, uh, we saw very clear differences in these three areas of the intrinsic membrane properties, the excitability, and the subthreshold filtering uh, of layer two, three pyramidal neurons uh, in the human versus the mouse um, layer two, three. Uh, and uh, so, you know, example of that is shown here in this plot of input resistance versus the depth from PIA, where the cell body was recorded. And you can see that these lines actually crisscross, uh, meaning that the input resistance uh, uh, decreases as you go deeper and uh, from the PL surface into the cortical depth uh, from superficial to deeper layers for the human neurons, but increases uh, for the mouse neurons. And uh, similarly, we see uh, crisscrossing of these lines for the firing rates as a function of depth and um, very different um, uh, subthreshold filtering. Uh, we encounter neurons that are resonant in human layer two, three in the deep part of layer three. Uh, and we, we don't really see that in, in the rodent layer two, three. That's more a property that's described for deep layer cells. Um, so this is an example of how we can do comparative studies uh, by doing these parallel programs on the mouse and the human with standardized approaches. Um, we also can take that further to do biophysical modeling. And we had a study uh, modeling uh, human layer three neuron with uh, looking at H channels and the contribution of the H channels to the uh, bandpass filtering uh, and various properties of these neurons. Uh, so we can use the real realistic morphologies of uh, human uh, layer three neurons um, and um, build those models based on uh, 
realistic uh, conductances and add in uh, IH or with or without IH, we can see what the effect of adding IH is. Uh, and here that effect was very clear that it, in, it introduces this bandpass filtering where um, the neurons amplify uh, these inputs in the theta range. Uh, so this is uh, well known uh, for various types of rodent neurons like CA1 pyramidal neurons and uh, layer 5 thick tufted neurons, but uh, something fairly interesting and unique uh, to see this in layer 3 human neurons. Um, we are trying to get tissue that's distal to the pathological focus, uh, but of course there's an opportunity to study disease tissue uh, in and of itself uh, and to go to the mesial temporal structures here showing brain slice of the hippocampus from epilepsy patients. And um, we can do this, the standard morphoelectric characterization here of granule cells. We can look at the uh, Weiler grade as a measure of the severity of the pathology. Uh, for example, on the highest end of that scale, you have severe hippocampal sclerosis and the CA1 layer is uh, completely obliterated. Uh, that certainly must have some impacts. And uh, what we can do is uh, measure uh, the responses from granule cells uh, across, uh, well, from uh, basically binning from mild to severe, and then build uh, in silico models of the network uh, and, and plug in the actual um, morphologies and uh, conductances uh, that are consistent with what we actually record, and then look at how the network behaves. Uh, and uh, this study has not been published yet, but uh, just showing as an example that this is a, another way to take this further is to, to go in the disease uh, route. Um, another tried and true approach is to measure synaptic connectivity using patch clamp uh, recording. Uh, we've built octopatch rigs at the Allen Institute, so eight electrodes for patch clamp uh, with a lot of automation. Uh, this is work from my colleague Tim Jarski and his team. Uh, I wasn't involved in the study, but just wanted to represent this really exciting um, use case where we can start to measure connectivity and get lots of uh, uh, connections at the same time uh, because of the large number of pipettes that are going in. Of course, it doesn't mean we're getting eight recording simultaneously every attempt, but it, you start with eight pipettes, and so you have a better chance of getting connected uh, networks and characterizing both the connectivity and the dynamics of the synaptic properties. And the main finding of this paper was that um, the connectivity rate was about double uh, for excitatory to excitatory connections in human layer three, layer two and layer three, as compared to the connection probability measured in um, mouse layer two, three of the cortex. Uh, and so to, to really illustrate the progression of ideas, uh, when the single cell transcriptomics started taking off, we really had to reevaluate uh, how we were going to approach these problems because, as I showed, we can study pyramidal cells in a layer and use that as a proxy for type. But uh, the reality is that that's not a fine enough distinction, that there are uh, far more than uh, one or two pyramidal neuron types in the neocortex. I think this is appreciated in, in, in virtually every brain region now, uh, including spinal cord, that there's quite a a great diversity and that gene expression is a great way to um, bin and parse and cluster uh, on types and to use that as a handle for uh, and as setting up a framework for um, going in and probing the properties of these distinct genetically defined types and to ask questions about what their functional contributions may be. And so um, the teams at the Institute performed this uh, single cell RNA sequencing from the human, uh, both postmortem and surgical tissue in the middle temporal gyrus region uh, and came up with 45 GABAergic types and 32 glutamatergic types with four glial types, uh, although the glial types were undersampled uh, intentionally. Um, and what this uh, tree demonstrates is that we can see the same uh, overall structure as what we expect from the known types uh, in the rodent neocortex. We still have the, the, the same uh, layer uh, divisions. We still have the interneuron subclasses, PV, VIP, SST, LAMP5. Um, and this really also can give us um, 
uh, estimates of the proportions of these types. And so the, the bar plot there is showing the proportions. And what this demonstrates is that across these roughly 100 types that we can distinguish based on gene expression, that virtually all of them are rare, which was uh, somewhat surprising. I, I don't know if that was intuitive. Uh, very few of them are actually abundant, and the most abundant type is about 15% of the population of these neuron or the cells. Uh, so that's something to really appreciate is uh, it, it creates a challenge for how you sample all of these cells. Uh, and, and so that's um, our framework. Uh, and also the sequencing, RNA sequencing provides many hypotheses for follow-up testing uh, based on the gene expression. You can predict what the functional uh, readout might be or response to a neuromodulator things like that. Um, important, equally importantly uh, is the ability to go back in with the spatial transcriptomics approach uh, using probes for the RNA uh, in C2 to be able to pinpoint the location and quantify the abundance of different types of cells that are uh, basically what we call transcriptomically defined cell types. And here's an example of that for layer five thick tufted neurons that we can uh, use specific marker gene probes uh, here now looking across species from human, macaque, mouse, and quantifying the abundance and location of these layer five thick tufted neurons. And what we described was that there's a great sparsification of these types uh, in the primate as compared to the rodent, and that they're actually very rare in the human uh, cortex. And this may relate to the great expansion of the neocortex, uh, whereas the subcortical targets, projection targets were not as greatly expanded. Um, and we can see things like, you know, enrichment for this type in the upper part of layer five, as opposed to the lower part of layer five, even though in rodent, a lot of people think these are synonymous with layer five B. Uh, and so there are some interesting things on that. Um, for um, uh, linkages between the morphoelectric characterization and the patch seat characterization, or sorry, morphoelectric characterization and the transcriptomic uh, characterization, we have this wonderful new technique, patch seek. Uh, I guess it's not so new anymore. It's several years old, but new to us in the context of adult human neurons. Uh, we're just getting around to publishing our first um, large scale uh, data set uh, that's recently been accepted. And um, this is really uh, exciting because we can see that when we map these cells after a physiology patch experiment based on their gene expression, that uh, we can bend them and see really tight uh, correspondence or coherence in the data based on the morphological profiles. Uh, for example, uh, the type is very different uh, than these other types, uh, just based on a quick glance. And also looking at the um, physiological features that uh, you can see very significant differences and very tight clustering within, but differences across type. And importantly, uh, these two types, CARM1P1 and CARM2031, uh, were identified as not having a homologous type in the mouse uh, layer 2-3. And so these could be really interesting in terms of evolution and, and function of uh, the human cortex. I'm, uh, I'm hearing a lot of uh, static. I think it's Tim. Tim, if you could mute yourself. Yeah. OK. Um, and then, uh, not to go into any great detail, but uh, one of the low-hanging fruits would be to really use these integrated approaches now, all of these approaches together, to really tackle going after things like cell types that don't exist in the mouse brain and can only be studied in the primate brain uh, directly. For example, a few years ago, our teams described a rose hip cell, a novel cell type in layer one of the neocortex together with Gabor Tomash. Uh, we've recently published work uh, where we think we've recorded for the first time from human von Economo neurons and described some differences between their neighboring pyramidal cells in layer five of the insula in human in a case study uh, from a rare specimen. And we also have a study uh, looking at uh, BET cells, which are found in various species, uh, including primate, but are not uh, found in, in the rodent, but there is a homologous cell type, and that's the layer five thick tufted neuron type. And so we describe some distinctive uh, electrophysiological signatures, and we use this patch seek mapping to really know that we're studying the homologous cell types. Uh, and we can also dive into the genes from the transcriptomes to say, what are the genes that are differentially expressed in this type across species? Um, this may be of great interest to the group. Um, 
that uh, we're trying to pioneer ways to work with the rapid autopsy human brain tissue, uh, try to uh, apply approaches like the nucleus extraction and the patch seek mapping. And we've shown that we can we can do this from uh, post-mortem tissue. We can um, spray dye over the slice and sort of outline uh, different morphological types like the von Economo neuron uh, shown here in the middle uh, and pull nuclei out and see that they map to the expected transcriptomic cell type. So the one that you see this red line going down with high confidence with a high number there, 98% uh, of the, the um, iterations of mapping, it goes to the same type of the thick tufted neuron, the layer five ET neuron. And um, in a more recent case, uh, we were able to show that we can get some uh, nice recordings and action potential firing and even repetitive firing of uh, neurons from a postmortem uh, human case. Although I have to say that this is very challenging and we've done dozens of cases where we failed to get any uh, reliable uh, action potential firing or quality recordings. And so I think this is definitely one of those things that's super risky and needs a lot more effort, but just to show that this may be a promising avenue uh, for the future. And um, to wrap up this presentation, uh, I want to end on what I think is the most exciting thing. And I was certainly inspired by the last seminar uh, and Cliff's uh, really nice data on the enhancers. And we're certainly very interested in this as well. Uh, we've been developing approaches to apply enhancer AAVs for cell type specific labeling in the human slices ex vivo uh, and to perform patch seek analysis. And this slide just demonstrates GABAergic labeling with one of these vectors. We've optimized this DLX enhancer to be incredibly strong so that it turns on with just uh, within two days uh, after infection. Uh, usually AAVs take a couple weeks, uh, but here we can do it in two days in slice culture. And what this allows us to do is then target fluorescently labeled inner neurons. And what we find is that we can now sample types that we weren't getting by random sampling or by just trying to go for non-pyramidal cells. So in patching a thousand human neurons uh, randomly in slices, we only had a handful of SST neurons sampled and we didn't understand that. Uh, but in the first uh, couple dozen recordings with the virus labeling strategy, we already had about one third of the neurons that we patched were SST neurons. And we could see that the physiological properties in the short-term cultures were very well preserved. So this is really exciting to us. We have a large study that we're actively trying to wrap up um, that really goes into using this approach to characterize the properties of these uh, canonical interneuron subclasses in the human slices. And then lastly, that leads uh, to this idea of really building a pipeline for cell type enhancer discovery and validation. And so we're doing single nucleus attack seek as our preferred assay. This is assay for transposase accessible chromatin. It's a method that can be done on small numbers of cells, uh, technically called single cell, but really you need uh, small collections of cells before you can start to resolve um, these open chromatin regions aligned to a genome browser and see where these enhancers reside, enhancers and promoters. Uh, but what we're going for are these uh, sort of distal regulatory elements near marker genes of uh, cell types and cloning those out into AAV vectors and packaging them and testing in various tissue platforms and validating the cell type specificity with uh, a variety of methods from multiplex fish, single cell RNA-seq profiling, immunohistochemistry, and patch-seq mapping. These are all ways to call how specific uh, the labeling is. And this is just a demonstration of in vivo labeling in the primate. Uh, this is macaque stereotaxic injection across different regions. In this case, we're showing one of our best parvalbumin enhancers that was recently published, uh, injected into primary visual cortex in the macaque and showing that 98% uh, of the labeled cells were parvalbumin specific and that we labeled 83% of the ones that were detected by the antibody for parvalbumin in that region, which was quite exciting. And, and I know there are several, uh, several enhancers now identified across multiple teams that are really great at targeting parvalbumin subclass uh, in various brain regions. So uh, that's where I'll stop. Um, thank you for uh, your attention and just want to acknowledge that this is uh, a lot of work from many of my colleagues that I'm representing here and also from my own team um, and uh, would be really happy to have discussion uh, at the end uh, and go back and dive in on deeper details for any of these topics that might be of great interest to this group. Uh, and um, 
yeah, would be really happy to uh, discuss some of the intersections between the different groups, uh, areas that might be fruitful for collaboration. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. I think we'll, we'll go straight to Reza, maybe, and then we can we come back for an open discussion. Uh, it'll be more uh, interactive, I think, this way, and then we can com compare notes and, uh, and challenge. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Let's see if Reza can master Zoom after a year and a half. <laughs> One second. Okay. Okay. Can you all see my slides? Yes. Okay. So uh, um, again, I want to thank Marie uh, Paquet, uh, Mario, for setting these uh, seminars up. It's very, very useful. Um, we have a slightly smaller team than Jonathan. So uh, we're running on a slightly uh, a smaller scale, but uh, I wanna tell you more about one of the uh, platforms that we have been uh, setting up in the past year or so and see how we can make everyone benefit from it in a way to accelerate uh, the pace of research. So I'll give you a little bit of background and then you know I'm happy to go over um, um, any questions that you have on how this platform functions and how we can help uh, others in the community set these up or have access to those tissues. So just very briefly, and most of you may already know this, but uh, my lab is interested in chronic pain in the mechanisms of pain and touch. And uh, chronic pain is uh, the leading source of mor morbidity worldwide. It's part of the 10 most prevalent disease groups, including osteoarthritis, back pain, and headaches. It has one of the biggest uh, impact on the economy, both in direct cost and the loss of productivity. Uh, in fact, the uh, budget in the US for 2011 exceeded uh, the uh, budget for the Department of Defense, you know, just to give you an idea. And the costs exceed those uh, related to heart disease, cancer, and diabetes combined. <clears throat> Um, so um, it, it is a very uh, uh, large problem, and often we make the uh, mistake of assuming that you know chronic pain is a disease associated with the elderly population. But there's a whole uh, uh, population of um, individuals that suffer from chronic pain. Some as early as birth, they have these uh, chronic pain symptoms that, for up to now, we still don't have proper ways to manage their pain and. You know, if you look at the lady on the left, for example, well, she's 40 years old now, but she's been suffering from chronic pain since age two. And uh, in a subset of these patients, often the uh, a very minor injury is enough to trigger this entire set of chronic pain symptoms. And we still don't know how this happens. You know, this can happen in college students who overnight develop chronic pain and have to completely change their life uh, goals after that. In addition to all of the uh, 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 senior citizens or you know war veterans, etc., that come back with chronic pain, so you know I, I mostly bring this up because they're really invisible in a sense to society because we don't really hear about these cases and oftentimes pain is associated as a secondary symptom of another disease. You know, so. Um, one of the problem why we still are lacking ways to treat these patients is that it's been very difficult to get uh, industry backing in uh, pushing drugs through clinical trials. And rightly so, because the majority of these uh, drugs will fail in clinical trials. Um, and you know, many uh, individuals have uh, highlighted, many scientists have highlighted this uh, problem with the way we do pain research, whether if it is the tests that are currently being used, or if it's just a species difference. But regardless of the cause, the high rate of uh, failure taking drugs to clinical trial means that you know, venture funding in uh, pain research is significantly uh, decreased. So if you look at the, uh, the, these graphs here, you can see that, let me just bring my laser pointer. <clears throat> 
you can see that despite the fact that uh, pain costs over $260 billion uh, in costs, it still um, receives a fraction of the venture funding that cancer research will get. And the same is right if you look on the right side, the prevalence of chronic pain is in the hundreds of millions in the US, but the venture funding remains high in other areas such as cancer. So, <clears throat> um, Part of this is because it doesn't mean that there hasn't been important discoveries in preclinical research in uh, new mechanisms for chronic pain. And you know, uh, this may sound biased the way I bring this up now, but even last year we had identified um, a new uh, molecular sensor for mechanical pain, as this could be, for, for example, a very targetable uh, uh, drug for treating patients. But the problem is that uh, you know, even with these findings, we still don't know whether these uh, targets would be useful at all in um, in clinical uh, research. So <clears throat> we've come to realize over time that there is this fundamental need for pain research to really look at the translational potential of these discoveries as early as possible. And, you know, at the time, um, there was the uh, group of Rob Giraud who had started working with human DRGs and uh, determining that they could be a valuable uh, tool to study the, uh, um, the, the uh, translational potential of these discoveries. And <clears throat> when we had identified this new uh, channel, we reached out to some of our colleagues, uh, Lisbeth Haglund, uh, Jean Ouellet, uh, and Laura Stone, because they had over the uh, past few years developed this system, this platform in which they went and got uh, human intervertebral discs. So they had formed a, a group studying a low back pain and they had generated this um, collaboration with Transplant Quebec, which is the provincial body uh, overseeing transplants. And essentially they were uh, taking out intervertebral discs from uh, post-mortem from these donors and using them in their studies. And we approached them and said, look, we have recently found this new uh, candidate gene that could be involved in pain sensing. And we'd really like to know if it could be involved uh, in human uh, nociception as well, in human pain sensing as well. So <clears throat> we, uh, so we were able to get these uh, human uh, DRG neurons from them and we're able to show that uh, uh, this new channel that we identified uh, named uh, TACON was not only expressed in human uh, sensor neurons when looking at the in situ hybridization level, but we also use protocols that the Gero lab had uh, developed to put them in culture and demonstrate that we can keep them for up to 30 days in culture and they would still show excitability. Uh, we could still record from them. And uh, more importantly for us, they did have um, mechanosensitive ion channels, which is what we were studying. Uh, so there would be a good model for us to pursue and look at whether this new channel that we had identified was expressed in these uh, pain sensing neurons. So uh, work that we are doing right now is to determine uh, what is the contribution of this new channel that we identified to the mechanosensitivity of human pain neurons. And over time, we've been able to assemble a team where essentially we have rheumatologists with us that provide us with synovial fluid from their patients, whether it's osteoarthritic patients or patients with, with rheumatoid arthritis. And then we can co-culture these inflammatory soups, uh, human inflammatory soups with human uh, sensory neurons and determine how they contribute to affecting the excitability of these pain neurons and through which mechanisms. So we have essentially shifted our operation, which used to be on mice uh, nociceptors and looking at the signaling cascade uh, that are involved in um, sensitizing those pain neurons completely to the human uh, system now. And seeing the, the benefits of being able to work in such an environment, we thought, there has to be a way that we can make others uh, benefit from this as well. So with um, Lisbeth Haglund and Jean Ouellette, we decided to build this platform uh, for translational pain research in a way to make 
others, uh, other scientists in the neuroscience field to start with benefit from um, these tissue. And the model that we had in mind was that we don't want uh, the, uh, the people who need this tissue to really feel the need that they have to collaborate with us. You know, we, we want to make this as free in a sense as possible whereby they just have to be approved by the hospital uh, MTA protocols, et cetera. And then we can ship them these uh, human tissue, live human tissue and you know, transfer the protocols that we have for how to work with them so that everybody can start um, adding a translational component to their research program. And the idea behind this is to really try to accelerate the pace of discoveries that will eventually lead accelerate the, uh, the uh, development of new pain drugs for the patients. Um, <clears throat> so the way the, the platform functions is that uh, we have a research coordinator that is in constant uh, discussions with Transplant Quebec. As soon as a donor is deceased, um, first the nurses reach out to the next of kin to go over you know, the wishes of the deceased. And then uh, we get a call to let us know at which hospital in the city is the harvesting of organs going to happen. So our team shows up there where the nurses and the surgeons are already present. And um, as first they will remove uh, the organs that are destined for transplantation. So lungs, kidney, heart, etc. cetera. And uh, then we get access to dorsal root ganglia and spinal cord. So we show up in the operating room with our oxygenated um, culture media, recuperate these and then rush back to the lab where we uh, uh, put the, uh, these organs in culture. So in the case of DRG neurons, we uh, go immediately to a dissociation step and make sure that the cells are all um, uh, healthy before we put them in culture. It's a process that takes about you know, um, three or four hours. And these um, harvesting usually happen late in the day. You know, we have to be in the operating room around 9 p.m. And by the time they start clamping the patient, it's usually around 11. So the, uh, the trainees who show up in the operating room, by the time they're done the culture, et cetera, they get home around six in the morning. But <clears throat> But they generate, you know, many cultural issues of human DRGs that can be used by the entire lab for the different projects that we have. Um, <clears throat> and we also keep the spinal cord. So the spinal cord, because we get a very long piece of spinal cord, then we actually cut it in three pieces. One that we immediately immersion fix for any immunohistochemistry experiment that we will have. The other one we freeze immediately so that we can do in situ hybridization studies on them. And the third piece, which usually we try to keep the, the, the lumbar enlargement or the center of the lumbar en enlargement for us, we uh, pass on the uh, vibratome to start cutting uh, slices and put them on the upright electrophysiology system to do slice electrophysiology. Um, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's an operation that is not uh, uh, free. I don't know if that's my next slide. Oh yes, so I just wanted to mention too, that um, we try to make the most out of each donor. Uh, so we don't have a lot of them. It's seasonal, you know, the majority of the donors will be male. The large part of them will be over age 50 or so. From time to time, we will get, you know, a donor that's in the twenties, in their twenties, but 90% or so will be male. Um, so we recently uh, started talking with the surgical team to be able to have access to trigeminal ganglia. And there is you know, an extra uh, level of complexity that is added because these uh, donors will still have to be presentable to the family for the funeral, et cetera. So for us, when we used mice in the past, getting access to the trigeminal ganglia, we used to just open the skull from the back and go in and you know, pull out those trigeminal ganglia. But in patients, you know, we had to have consultations with some of those uh, neurosurgeon, neurosurgical interns uh, to find a way we have to go like right above the ear to make an incision and everything has to be sutured back perfectly so that there's very little visibility when the body is presented to the family. 
but we are developing these techniques. We got the approval. Now we just have to go in and um, uh, practice a few times first uh, at the morgue, you know, on, on uh, fully deceased uh, patients, and then uh, go on and try this on uh, freshly deceased uh, donors. <clears throat> um, and we're pushing our approaches on spinal cord electrophysiology as well. So, you know, I was very happy to hear Jonathan says that, say that these parvalbumin enhancer seems to be uh, working very well. We have in the past uh, examined uh, the role of spinal cord interneurons in the processing of touch and pain information, one of them being those parvalbumin neurons. So our work includes a lot of um, in vivo uh, um, control of neural activity using optogenetic tools or pharmacogenetic tools. We combine these two slice electrophysiology experiments and we, um, we also use uh, single cell expression data that is out there to identify what are the conductances that are expressed in those interneurons to build a mathematical model of the firing of these neurons and try to understand you know, what could go wrong when, how can their electrical activity be modified in the uh, context of uh, disease. So, <clears throat> We have done this already now on, on the mouse uh, uh, spinal cord and been able to verify our uh, predictions experimentally. But now having access to human uh, spinal cord means that we can go one step further and try to validate those predictions on uh, human uh, spinal cord neurons, which hopefully with these uh, uh, new approaches that um, either through discussions with the Allen uh, Institute or with some of the tools that Mariev's platform are uh, building, we can be able to um, visibly ident visually identify these neurons in the spinal cord of uh, human donors. So very quickly, there are costs in running this platform. You know, one of our uh, biggest costs are the surgical residents. Uh, our um, co-director, Jean Ouellet, who's an orthopedic surgeon, recruits many of these uh, surgical residents or orthopedic uh, residents through this effort because they have to do this uh, on the side uh, of their own uh, commitments and they usually have graveyard shifts you know so they have to be available 24 7 and mostly between 9 p.m to like 1 a.m or so so we we often try to get at least three residents so that they can rotate so that we always have somebody on call and the research coordinators as well and we have built a cost recovery system um, as a way to keep the fees uh, minimal for the uh, basic scientists so that we can encourage people to adopt this uh, platform um, more easily. Uh, but we have uh, gone through grant application as well with uh, academics uh, submitting grants, uh, you know, requesting a small a fraction of their budget for the costs associated with running the platforms. Um, we haven't yet made the platform uh, public, but just word of mouth got us a few uh, industry partners to want to test their compounds. So we have one um, cannabis company that uh, with whom we signed a, a research agreement to test their compounds on human uh, uh, sensory neurons so that they can have this additional validation. and. You know, one of the things that, that I skipped over because it's maybe not relevant for this group is that we think that by having this first inhuman drug validation uh, uh, assay, we can give these industry partners a go, no go uh, um, uh, result before they take their compound through these costly clinical trials. So this is something that uh, is very appealing to them. And we have, we are in negotiations now with a second slightly larger uh, pharma to fund the platform over a three year period. So these are always complicated because the MTAs are slightly different, ethical review boards uh, always need proper explanations as to how can somebody, how can a company benefit from human tissue? So we have to always be uh, very careful in explaining to these uh, ethical boards that we could do it without the industry partners but maybe it will take 20 years before we have a new pain drug for these patients, but collaborating with them will accelerate the rate of drug discovery so that in the end, 
the, the um, better treatment get to the patients faster. And both universities and uh, uh, these pharmas a very big compliance team. So, you know, there are uh, many layers of uh, approvals that are needed, but, you know, we're so far satisfied with this. There are a lot of government support program as well for these platforms. And, uh, you know, we have to do these uh, fundraising pitches for philanthropic organizations as well. But overall, you know, we're very excited about this platform and we're always happy to make the tissue available to any of our colleagues. We're actually pushing one of the things that we have noticed is that there, there's a very little um, resistance to change you know like getting more scientists to use the these tissue is uh, harder than we thought you know we thought that people would be interested but i think that you know it's it's a slow process and we're we're optimist that it's going to change uh, very very shortly so I don't want to take too much time uh, of this. Really quickly, the people that have helped. Stephanie uh, in my lab, a PhD student in my lab, is the one who goes most of the times, collect these tissues, bring them back to the lab, and runs them. Luc Petitjean uh, and Lise Rabi are postdocs in the lab that have worked with these, especially the spinal cord. And uh, Chen and uh, Howie are uh, undergrad students who have also been uh, helping setting up these um, human tissue uh, recordings. Okay, so I wanna stop there and leave uh, time for any discussions that we have. Thank you uh, everyone for uh, your attention. Thanks guys. Uh, great, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of material, I guess, to, to launch the, the discussion. Uh, I see people are clapping. So uh, I guess, uh, Mario, you can help me also if there are things in the chat uh, that, uh, as usual, folks, uh, feed your questions in the chat. Not enough Some people can talk. Voice in the background. I don't know what it is. Um, Maybe I'll start with one point to you too, a technical one uh, around this whole challenge of getting uh, human tissue and, and what it means and so on. And I guess there's one fundamental difference between uh, what Reza is doing with, and, and we are trying to do with spinal cord versus uh, what people have done with the brain and what you're doing, Jonathan, I think you, I don't remember exactly how you said you were controlling, but I think you said a large proportion of those are, are epilepsy related patients and so on. So in the brain, we can benefit from the opportunity to extract brain tissue in when there is ablation that's going to be done. Uh, with the spinal cord, uh, it's very, very rare. There's some situations where we can get the dorsal ganglion tissue when there's a Cordotomy, uh, cordotomies that are done because uh, for extreme conditions, but then it's usually associated with a very, very uh, debilitating or, or terminal situation uh, with cancer and so on. So there is this whole thing about postmortem, getting them postmortem, and for spinal cord, that's what uh, some of us has been doing to try to get postmortem tissue. Uh, okay, I suppose there are challenges there, but at least it. Uh, gets around, uh, maybe we can get tissue from any any donor who uh, doesn't necessarily have a, a, a pathological condition. Uh, I wonder if, if this is something, you, how you guys are handling this at the Allen, uh, uh, the type of tissue you're getting and, and, uh, and have you guys seen any impact with the types of variables that you are looking at? Maybe it's also not as critical. Yeah, I think it's a, a great discussion topic. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, what I would say is that our strategy has been the long game, that uh, we want to collect all the patient metadata that we can, all the disease history, all of the drugs uh, that they're actively taking, you know, seizure history, uh, anything that we can collect. Um, we have sort of a standard form that asks for this information. Some of it is, uh, you know, the patient will opt out uh, providing, but 
Um, in some cases, we even get deep information about IQ, uh, and we just log all of this information in the database and make it searchable and filterable uh, so that you know you can't really make a clear picture out of one or two or a dozen cases, but after a hundred surgical specimens uh, across a hundred donors, uh, and we've recorded many neurons from each donor, uh, you can start to really put put the puzzle together and understand, um, you know, what the what the impacts are of these various um, uh, these various conditions or drug treatments or you know brain region, gender, age, all of those uh, important pieces of metadata. Um, correlated with cellular features. And uh, another approach that we're really excited about, uh, which will be in our forthcoming uh, manuscript um, uh, at Nature, is that we've tried to do a really rigorous neuropathology assessment of every case uh, that we collect, where we not, we're not doing the um, immunohistochemistry panel with cell type markers on the pathological focus. We're doing it on the, the distal tissue that we actually use for the recordings. Uh, so that's a little bit different than uh, a standard neuropath assessment. And we have that data for virtually every case. And we had um, a blind neuropathology scoring of three different ne trained neuropathologists across all of that image data uh, for half a dozen cellular marker stains. And then we, um, so, you know, that's on a three point scale where zero is normal, neurotypical and three is highly pathological. So it's a little bit uh, um, pseudo quantitative. And then we can correlate um, you know, across all of the recordings that are binned by each donor. Uh, if there are any, we can look if there are any correlations at the cellular level between those features we've measured uh, and the degree of pathology as judged by this uh, blind neuropathology assessment. And the long story short is that what we found was that um, first of all, that the cell types that we can identify are robust to all of these variables that are uncontrolled in the human surgical specimens that we collect. Uh, for example, you can find these five predominant layer two, three types across all of these different donors. Um, uh, and then the second point uh, being that we could not uh, find really any um, features, uh, electrophysiological features uh, that were um, strongly affected, significantly affected, uh, and tied to that um, higher versus lower neuropathology score overall, uh, like uh, index of neuropathology. So that was very surprising to us. And I don't know that that's the only way or even the best way, but we feel like that's a, a more rigorous assessment than, than other people have been able to do with case studies or small cohorts of, of donors. Um, and uh, hopefully that that's a step in the right direction towards both providing all the information so everyone can do their own analyses with that data and also providing some uh, interpretation of that data ourselves. Um, we have uh, built in, it's not, sorry, let me just change it. Uh, um, I guess thorough as uh, the one Jonathan has, but we have, uh, with the approval of those uh, Transplant Quebec, been able to build in a short questionnaire that the nurses from Transplant Quebec provide to the next of kin to be able to get some information. Now, they don't often, they don't always uh, fill those out because they they were just told that you know one of their uh, close people died, but it includes you know was the loved one uh, under. Um, chronic pain, uh, drug medications, and any opioid uh, abuse, substance abuse, and things like that. But they really uh, ask us to restrict it to like three to five questions maximum, because uh, the chances of having it filled by those uh, patients is not, um, uh, by, the, by the next of kin is not always uh, a given. And um, we are trying to work with Transplant Quebec to be able to have access to the medical record of those um, donors. It's not an easy, uh, it's an uphill battle, but you know, we're still uh, trying to get that going. I have, I have a follow-up, but uh, Cliff, Clifford has a question. Uh, Tim had one, but I think he dropped it off. So Cliff, go ahead, uh, Clifford. Go. Ah, there we go, the unmute. Um, just, Thank you both for these wonderful talks. Uh, they really were uh, uh, 
great. I, I uh, the the idea of doing electrophysiology and and single cell patch is is amazing, Jonathan. Uh, and then uh, doing the single cell RNA seq on that uh, just takes it even further. And doing it in people's neurons it makes it even more interesting. I wonder what I didn't get from from that uh, was were you uh, able to just get the single cell RNA seq from the patch seq, or can you actually get the nuclei and and get the an ATAC seq uh, kind of result from it as well? It's either or. Yes, uh, we're not doing it in the same experiment, um, but we that's how we have done our studies uh, with the um, single single nucleus attack seq. It's on uh, fresh neurosurgical specimens. Um, we did not use postmortem or, or frozen. We we did evaluate those, but we find that it's much better on the fresh neurosurgical tissue, um, and so uh, we built a you know relatively small. Uh, scale data set. It has a few thousand neurons from human middle temporal gyrus uh, with that single nucleus attack seek. And that was the basis for the recent cell reports paper that um, uh, was recently um, advanced online. It's not in print yet, um, where we go through and find lots of enhancers for various subclasses uh, of neurons. And a lot of the testing there was done in the rodent out, out in the mouse out of necessity as the starting point for a high throughput screen. But then some of them, like the one I showed, were, were validated by in vivo stereotaxic injection in the monkey. And uh, there's also a fair amount of data or some data for testing in the human ex vivo slices and some surprises in there that you might be very interested in about, you know, what things hold up and what things change due to culture artifact. But certainly there are many enhancers we can find that function as predicted across these platforms and would be useful for working on human neurons and slices ex vivo. Uh, but then there are others like some of the parvalbumin enhancers that did not uphold their specificity. And that's another challenge for the field. So to get back to your original question, um, I think it would be great. And my colleague Boaz Levy is really pushing for this to do the single nucleus attack seek assay on cultured human slices and see if that helps us to better predict which enhancers you can make into viral tools that would label the predicted cell types. And I think that would be fantastic for people who want to work in that human ex vivo slice uh, culture platform. Absolutely. I mean, it, that actually goes right to my question for, for, for Riza actually, which is, by the way, I can certainly, I, I thanks a lot for, uh, you know, providing, you know, such a link to basic scientists for this so precious tissue. For this, I mean, making it. Uh, I, I can assure you that there will be, uh, with some of your Quebecois colleagues, we will uh, make use of this amazing resource you've got. But I mean, that's the thing is, is we've got to kind of understand. I mean, there there is, is exigencies with human tissue, with especially with donor tissue, right? I mean, there there. I, I wonder if what one thing we need to do is share our quality control data. How long postmodem or rather post-mortem is good for RNA-seq. How long is it good for, for a, a uh, for ATAC-seq? You know, I mean, this is something that you can do in an animal model and just see how much change do you get after X amount of time. You know, and I don't know if anyone's actually done that, but I think that would be really, really useful because you want to get the most uh, bang for the buck out of a, a, a human donor tissue for sure. You know, and you have to first get the organs for transplant, obviously. So, to, yeah. so is there anything uh, like quality control ideas in terms of what things one can do in terms of well, culturing? How long after he is getting culture in, and are they changed from there? Uh, I mean, um, our our best way to tell is to look at the uh, electrophysiology of these cells because we know, for example, in some of them, the uh, the morphology, the, the uh, the shape of the action potential that will be generated is an indication of in how much health they're in. You know, um, we have. It seems to be for DRGs at least they seem to be more resilient. So we have gotten some out after uh, four hours post mortem and some after ninety minutes post mortem. Now we haven't checked uh, about the um, quality for these uh, single cell um, sequencing methods, but we have, um, we do collect them for a, 
not a collaborator, but a colleague who's actually doing single cell nucleus, uh, single nucleus sequencing on human DRG neurons. And um, I don't think he's in the audience right now. Uh, Philippe is not here, right? But he would be able to tell you. But I think that they do run these uh, quality control steps before uh, moving on to the uh, sequencing phase. So uh, it does exist. I just don't have, because we don't do them here in the, uh, us in the lab, I don't have the information to give you, but it is out there, yeah. Thank you. So, so there's a question in, in the chat from Tim uh, about, I guess it links to some of this is that the, you know, the, the, well, Tim is interested about, you know, difference in the pharmacology that you guys have found Reza, in, in the human tissue versus uh, uh, non-human tissue. Uh, I guess it goes a little beyond that, you know, the differences that people are seeing between the human tissue and, and all the preclinical work, how, how bad is or how useless is our preclinical work? Uh, uh, th there's definitely, I mean, there's, there's uh, Tim is alluding to the fact that, you know, the potency for certain drugs or the pharmacology could be very different in the human tissue. It also goes with, you know, channel expression and so on. And uh, we certainly have a student that Reza just corrected his the thesis of, uh, he, he did not fail it. So, he, he bought some of the data that shows that the ASIC distribution in humans may be very, very different. ASIC channels may be very different than what it is in, in the mice. So how much, I mean, you started, you have some of this, uh, Jonathan, how much do you find that the, the difference on that front? And Reza, have you found striking difference in terms of pharmacology with respect to other, uh, other models before? Right. Well, um, my response is going to be shorter than, than Jonathan's, but we haven't tested um, all the drugs to be able to go back and compare. There's already data out there about, I think, P2X um, and having <coughs> different um, uh, potency on human versus um, rodents uh, work. But any, uh, you know, any drug uh, would be easy to just run a quick dose response curve and be able to examine the uh, the IC50. So we're doing that with cannabinoid compounds right now and be able to compare them to known uh, analgesics to be able to, um, you know, relate their potency as uh, potential analgesic drugs. So it is uh, definitely something that's feasible on the human tissue. Mm. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I, from our perspective, I, I don't think that many of us here are deep experts in, in pharmacology aspect, but uh, it's our aspirational goal to really dive into the single cell RNA sequencing data. You know, it's, it's, it's good for a lot more than just mapping cells to a taxonomy. That's like touching the tip of the iceberg and that you have read out of 10,000 or more genes for every individual cell. And so really it creates a roadmap. And uh, so many, I mean, just um, treasure trove of predictions about function for these cell types. And so what we're trying to do is explore the predictive power and, and sort of verify if the, if the predictions really hold from RNA to protein to, you know, the functional readout. And I think that's still an open question for the field. Uh, we're only just getting into this, but for example, it was identified, um, I didn't mention, but that the, the building the taxonomies through the RNA sequencing is a good way to establish mapping of homologous cell types across species because you have taxonomies built on gene expression differences done in a standardized way for multiple species. And you can align those taxonomies. You can say, based on gene expression, that these are the matching cell types. And it doesn't mean you always have one-to-one -one matching. But let's say in the case that you do, um, now you can ensure that when you're testing a drug that you're doing an apples to apples comparison. Uh, and you can also look into the genes that are expressed by that cell type and see what are the neuromodulators or receptors that pop out as differentially expressed to guide your functional testing and pharmacology experiments. And uh, one of the biggest differences that we saw between mouse and human in our initial cross species comparison from transcriptomics was serotonergic signaling. And if you look at the serotonergic receptor expression in the RNA sequencing across um, cortical neuron types, you see a lot of differences, a lot of profound differences, and not the least of which is that you also have to worry about the fact that you, we've identified cell types that don't have a homologous type in the human uh, layer two, three, deep layer three in particular, that do, they do not have a homologous type in the mouse layer two, three, and that they have 
um, expression of these receptors. And if you try to do the drug screening on the mouse slices, there's no way to really translate that to what you would expect to get in terms of uh, response from a human brain slice or a human patient. And so I think that illustrates another layer of complexity to Tim's question that, um, you know, this these precious tissues afford us this opportunity to explore not only novel cell types, but also the effects of uh, important uh, pharmacological agents, uh, things with p potential medicinal value, like um, uh, psychedelic drugs that act on these serotonergic uh, pathways uh, on on these neurons that are unique to the human uh, cortex uh, over over mouse. We, uh, may, may I see that Menina is in the audience. Menina is the one I was alluding to who's, who did the, the, uh, the uh, analysis of basic channels in, in Africans and saw a big difference between humans and mice. Now, there's one thing, uh, if there's not another question, there's one thing, uh, it because of course there's these differences, but then of course there's a question that was brought up is, you know, how good is this tissue with, you know, how, how much things have changed in this tissue if it's postmortem or disease related or whatever, related a bit to what Cl Clifford said. But one thing I think it's worth mentioning, Jonathan and, and, and Reza, well, Reza, you haven't really done, I think, s s too much slice work from spinal cord, but we, with, uh, with uh, Mike Kildebrand in, in uh, Ottawa, we've done a fair bit there. And I have colleagues in Australia that are doing a lot of non-human primate slice work. And I think one thing that's worth mentioning to the electrophysiologists doing slice work in the room that I don't think are aware of is how, how much, an order of magnitude, at least hardier, the human, but the non-human primate and the human tissue is in vitro. You're, you're alluding to Jonathan using viral vectors, you know, for a couple of days and so on. So what, what you're implying is this is, and you guys, I think are keeping sometimes the human slices for several days up to a week. This is completely, completely unheard of in, in, ro in rodents. So rat slices that live five, six hours, and that's about it. Uh, when you talk about slice culture, I, I think we have to make sure that people understand that you're not talking about the organotypic slice culture that people do in rodents where they start with the very young, young tissue and then they let it grow. This is adult tissue that you can keep in, in there for a long time. So I think that's another major, major uh, point to stress that what it's related to is, is perhaps still a bit uh, uh, question, but the how robust, how more robust the human tissue is in vitro uh, is also, I think, a very important asset to keep in mind, and may be mitigating some of the uh, concerns about phenotypic change uh, over time. Absolutely. I, I mean, I would love to, to talk about this for a whole seminar, uh, but I know I, I need to keep it very brief. And I would just say that that's where we got our initial ideas from of bringing sort of the whole suite of molecular genetic tools to the table for these human ex vivo slices was the early observations that these slices just don't die. You, know, you keep them on the countertop bubbling in carbogen. And if you just change the media out every 12 hours, we were patching cells 24, 48, I think the longest that we we published was 72 hours. Um, you know, this is not in an incubator; it's just sitting on the countertop. And and as you said, you can't do that with a rodent slice without some dramatic uh, intervention there. Um, and you know, I, I could speculate about what the biological basis of that was. Uh, you know, I found that I can keep rodent slices alive 10 times longer by adding just glutathione ethyl ester, so um, a cell permeable um, uh, antioxidant. Uh, and so we think it might have something to do with better mechanisms for dealing with oxidative stress. Um, but, you know, uh, that was the impetus to try to move them into a paradigm where we could do rapid viral labeling. And um, other groups uh, beyond our group have even succeeded at going out a month or longer for the human slice culture and viral labeling, uh, like to look at longer term effects. Um, you could even start thinking about CRISPR. Uh, AAV type approaches uh, and gene uh, protein uh, disruption, targeted protein disruption uh, in a slice paradigm. 
so it is very exciting. I think that uh, I didn't talk about functional tools at all. I know the group is very interested in functional tools. It's on our radar and we're just trying to figure out what are the correct or what are the most useful local circuit or you know types of paradigms that it makes sense to do these types of manipulations like optogenetic uh, activation or, or dreads or um, calcium indicators. Uh, and we're, we're actively working on, you know, ensuring that our viral tools we make to target cell types can do more than just carry a GFP payload. Um, and I'm sure that that's a, a topic that many on the call are interested in. Uh, and um, I just want to say that I think that uh, uh, Reza's choice of working on the human DRGs from, from the uh, postmortem tissue is probably a very smart choice. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed at sort of the description of how hardy those are and how nice the physiology can be. And I think that it's much more challenging to work with cortical tissue several hours post-mortem. And I think so a lot of thought should go into uh, potential differential viability of brain regions and cell types uh, to try to start somewhere where you can really make progress and not just hit your head against the wall uh, as we've done with some areas of the brain, you know, from 90 plus year old deceased people uh, where the, the quality is not great in, in, the, in the beginning with, you know, dementia or other confounds. So it sounds like the program that's being developed uh, on his end is, is really uh, a smart choice and will hopefully have a lot of insights for us on, on, on ways to go for these postmortem experiments. Um, there were some optimization steps that we had to um, work with the surgical staff to try to help us improve the viability of the tissue, uh, especially when it came to the spinal cord. So, it took a, you know, it took a bit of time to get them to adopt some of these. But for example, when they start opening the patient to extract lungs or heart, et cetera, we asked them to fill the abdominal cavity with ice, with ice uh, packs, you know. And uh, this has been uh, an improvement uh, for us in, uh, you know, extending the viability of the tissue. Um, and we're trying, we're trying to get them to perfuse. So right now they, they perfuse the body, but just with a 20 degrees Celsius uh, sterile physiological saline type of uh, solution. And we'd like them to be able to adapt that a little bit so that we can have more colder and maybe you know have some of those antioxidants or anything that can sort of reduce uh, cell metabolism while they're doing the uh, harvesting of the organs. But you know we have to go back and back to those uh, uh, surgeons to try to get them to change their habits. But you know these are things that have worked for us in uh, increasing the viability of the organs. So uh, okay, so I guess Tim, you're Tim, you're, you're it's not Jonathan, you're you're you're, uh, you're you're responding in the chat. So there are questions in the chat about from Tim and from uh, Clifford about uh, biobanks and and uh, data sets and so on. But before we go to this, uh, maybe Arthur, Arthur has a question. Uh, you want to say something? Uh, yes, I have to unmute before I say anything. So uh, I guess I didn't read your paper from, from three years ago. And uh, um, I was struck by the... You sound like a graduate student, Arthur. <clears throat> yes, I am. I am. Three years. Uh, I was struck by the differences in the you know, very fundamental properties of mouse versus human neurons, like the resting potential. So where do you think that difference comes from? You know, how does it align with transcriptomic profiling? You know, is it, you, know, you can make a, a neuron, you know, I'm not a physiologist, but I understand that it's, a, it's about a combination of expression of different channels, right? Transporters. And so you can achieve the same resting membrane potentials in different ways. So is that what you're seeing there? And can you, can you, can you relate this to, you know, transcriptomics, but also proteomics, I guess, you know, level of expression of different, um, you know, physiologically relevant proteins? Yeah, I, I, I don't think we've dived so deep to get into the proteomics part of that, but, I, but um, the way I look at it is that there's this great opportunity for a reinterpretation or reimagination revisiting uh, old findings through the lens of transcriptomics. And so when we published that uh, neuron study on the H channels comparing mouse and human uh, a couple years ago, we were not using the patch seek approach. We were using the uh, standard uh, patch clamp with uh, biocyte and cell filling. Um, we were you know, 
using layer as a proxy of type. And so we bundled all of those layer two, three recordings together. And the main thing is we kept careful track of the depth of each cell body through the layer so we could correlate with depth, uh, which is something that other people just kind of lost that information by combining it together. And that really revealed one of these um, very, very strong uh, organizing principles of the human uh, supergranular cortex, which is the depth dependence of all of these features, morphological, physiological features. And um, now we can reimagine that through the lens of the transcriptomics, through the technique of the patch seek mapping, and really deconvolve that to, uh, you know, are there discrete types that always have uh, specific membrane properties? And are there uh, continuous uh, types that vary across the whole cortical depth? And that's what we saw in this latest study that's about to come out soon, but it's, a, it's in preprint form now, is that there are these five types that we can recognize based on the patch seek mapping and one of those types is the abundant type, and it's found all the way from the top to the bottom of layer two, three, and it just has continuous variation in those EFIS features in a, in a graded way, you know, in a, in a predictable way, like getting lower input resistance as you go deeper, having more sag as you go deeper in the depth uh, within that type of cell. But then there are other types of cells that are only found at the layer three, four border, and they have, you know, much tighter um, physiological properties when you plot things like input resistance or SAG or resonance, they're very tight. They're not a continuous variation um, like you see in this other type. So I think um, a lot of that will be um, more clear if you were able to see that preprint and there's a lot of information in there. I, I feel like I'm not describing it, uh, doing it justice, but really it's deconvolving the mixture of all these intermingled cell types that exist in different proportions. Uh, and are maybe not really recognizable without the benefit of the patch seek mapping. So, so you know, you could you could maybe even apply the same principle that you know you can get this you know very different neurons using the same channel, same receptors, to kind of you know what particular neurons do in a in a, in a given circuit. That it's really you know you can make the circuit do a certain thing by having, you know, really uh, a, a large number of combinations of neurons, right? So there's di diff different possibilities of getting the same thing done by a circuit. And what I'm getting at is, you know, it, it, are, are you finding this, you know, uh, uh, as a difference between mouse and, and human cortex? Can you really directly map, you know, neuronal identities, you know, or neuronal types, uh, you know, as highly conserved and doing exactly the same thing in the human and mouse cortex? And are you seeing, you know, one thing that I guess I might predict is that, you know, the more complex or maybe more abstract computations that a circuit must do, the more sort of leeway for deviations and variations there is. So maybe the, the more upstream you are and maybe something like a sensory, you know, uh, pathway, right? So if you're at the beginning, like Reza looking at sensory neurons, there might be a great degree of, degree of conservation, but the further downstream you go, the more divergence you have of, you know, cell types, you know, that, that look the same, but actually do completely something completely different. Is that, is, you know? If I can actually interject here, because you, I mean, what you're alluding to here, Arthur, is also the issue of, the, of degeneracy, that there are many, many combinations that lead to the same solution. And actually, even in the, even in the DRG, Steve Prescott wrote a very nice series of papers on this even just at this, if you consider this at the single cell level, uh, you can really see uh, a lot of degeneracy even in DRGs, and and uh, so that that you know cells can maintain certain biophysical properties, intrinsic uh, excitability properties, uh, in very different conditions of of, of of channel combination. But I guess uh, it's nice to hear. Arthur talking about the beauty of physiology over anatomy. Uh, it's a great concept what you're raising is, is in the end, what really matters is the behavior of the cell or their molecular composition uh, throughout the evolution. So you're saying that a mouse DRG is, can be very different from a human DRG neuron? I, well, there's some, some evidence of that. I mean, even I think that the, the obvious examples where there, there have to be uh, abundant differences is if you take these layer five thick tufted neurons, just look at what they look like 
lined up next to each other at match scale between a mouse and a human, the apical dendrite is, uh, you know, two millimeters long uh, uh, in the case of these human neurons, whereas it's only a couple hundred microns long in the mouse. So the geometry and the, the anatomy uh, morphology really does put some uh, constraints uh, in terms of the density of channels, you know, the somatodendritic distribution, you know, how far up the tough dendrite uh, they go in order to, um, you know, compensate to potentially produce a similar type of output or perform a similar type of computation. Uh, but there's no guarantee that they're performing uh, identical computations. After all, they're forming up in local circuits that connect with cell types that perhaps don't exist in, in other species. So I think we're just at the beginning of this and I don't have great answers to those questions, but just to say that it's really exciting times to use maybe things like approaches like computational modeling, biophysical modeling, and use the RNA sequencing as a way to constrain those models that if you don't see that those genes are expressed in a certain type, uh, you, you don't wanna add those conductances to your model, right? Uh, but just because you see that the RNA is there, you can't assume that that translates into functional protein without knowing uh, the protein level and the somatodendritic distribution of that uh, protein in the neurons. And, and the computation will also give us cues about the firing pattern, which is going to be very important too once we get there. So uh, Tim had a question about Alan, uh, Alan uh, Br Br uh, Biobank. I think he wants a piece of your brain, uh, uh, Jonathan. But uh, but then maybe I see the time flying, and maybe we should give Marie-Ève the last uh, question since it's, it's her. No, I just had a, a quick question for Reza actually, because so Jonathan talked about this this whole pipeline, and of course they have uh, more people and and access to a lot more tissue but do you see that you know in in the province for example you know there could be other sides to your platform and could we think about maybe setting up such a pipeline where you know of, of testing and 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 then after that comes the question of when when you start generating data in different sites like this like how do you actually ensure that this data is going to be you know, in, in uh, acquired in a way that everybody's going to be able to understand. And I really, I really um, appreciated what Jonathan said about, you know, um, this 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 data about the the different layers that was lost in some of the studies, and then you guys had it, and then were able to come back to it. And so, in in this whole process of of acquiring data, I think it's uh, you know we have to keep in mind that there's data there maybe that we don't know yet is important but so so basically do you do you see Reza, that this could we could do something larger scale with this yeah, and, absolutely. because we need more data really right yeah yeah so we want the first year to just be devoted to demonstrating have a few papers come out of the platform to demonstrate that it works but the next step for us is to extend the technical expertise to all the other harvesting sites in the province as a start so that means the uh, surgical uh, team will have to train the surgeons at the other hospital sites on the best ways to dissect out spinal cord and DRGs and have the labs as well. So we have to reach out to all the labs that are in the vicinity of those hospitals to show them how to best work with human spinal cord, how to best work with human DRGs. Uh, the idea would be to delegate them, you know, to have as many uh, sites as possible across the province as a first stage, and then we can go bigger but uh, to be able to increase the output like that. yeah. So that's definitely one of the ways. And if we can use this platform as a way to raise the money so that these other sites that are outside of, uh, you know, outside of our vicinity, we can contribute to the salaries of those interns, et cetera, then it's even better because we provide them with a service which they have minimum financial investment. Yeah. I guess, um, and I would just, this I would just add that uh, about the brain bank question, I would just add very quickly that uh, Allen Institute is working with brain banks and we're recipients of tissue. Uh, we're doing things like 20 species, cross species studies with transcriptomics. And so we don't function necessarily as a, a brain bank to distribute tissues. But if people are interested and they want to follow up, I can connect you with some of my colleagues that are very deeply involved in uh, accessing the brain banks. And um, as far as it relates to the primate tissue, there was a question that was unanswered. Uh, about our access to primate tissue and, and whether we could distribute that tissue. I would say it's the same thing that we're working on a small scale to 
take all those techniques we said that we can do in the human and now try to also apply them and port them over to the primate uh, adult macaque tissues. And so we're actively going through that and, and doing feasibility studies, but we're not uh, doing it at a large scale right now. Some of the initiatives that we have also, I mean, to go back to uh, Maia's, we could have a whole session on, on data standards and, and sharing uh, neural data with our borders and, and, and the likes. And we are engaged in some of that at, at, within our neurophotonics initiatives and, and across uh, the province. Uh, but coming back to tissue, I guess uh, uh, it is when you say uh, tissue banks, uh, I'm not sure if you're alluding to post uh, to the fixed or frozen versus live tissue bank, but I, I assume or maybe tell me if, if that's what how you see it, but the, the, the model is still to revert back to local uh, local uh, access. Uh, so, establish some network where people have access to local tissue and and I guess then that therefore means therefore along what Reza has said that the objective is then to standardize approaches across sites so that people are harvesting locally but we are all following the same uh, strategies is that uh, that's you? right yeah we're I, I was talking about frozen tissues for the brain banking yeah. um, I, I've heard of people who are going as far as, you know, driving two hours to collect human or, or monkey live tissues and try to bring it back to the lab and do experiments and having some success with that. Uh, but largely we're trying to work within, you know, the closest proximity uh, collaborators that we can, and that's the best chance of success. Yeah, for us, I mean, just as, as, a, as an anecdote, when we get the DRGs from the hospital back to the lab, we start the dissociation, like the incubation in collagenases on the trip back, you know? So, you know, we initiate all this as we go. And many do that, you know, I don't know if some of you know Elena Grasheva and Slav Bagriansev at Yale, but they work on the mallard, it's kind of duck. So they have to go hunt it. <laughs> and then they start the dissociation on their car as they're driving back to their lab, you know? It's just to accelerate steps so that you have the most viable tissue uh, as possible. So I think in the interest of time, we'll have to stop here. And uh, I just wanna thank Jonathan and uh, Reza so much. This was really great. And um, you know, if, if, if there's any of these issues that interest you guys, the audience, you know, I'm, I'm sure that Jonathan and Reza would be happy to talk further. And um, I would like to mention that we'll be having another um, seminar later this summer, sometime in July, the, the dates haven't really been decided yet, but um, hopefully this will be on the um, more using primates as a model and especially talking about optogenetics. And um, we'll be having Keith Morai from McGill and uh, Sébastien Tremblay, who's at, uh, at UPenn right now. And he's the one who published a paper uh, recently on um, this large database of uh, optogenetics in primates. So hopefully we'll see you guys there. And uh, thanks again. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you all so much. Appreciate bye -bye. it. Bye-bye. Thanks for that. Bye, Ru.